Well, hi, everybody. Uh, this is looks like it's a small, intimate group that we have, so it uh, makes it particularly easy for anybody to uh, jump in with any comments or questions. The actual core talk here is only about 21 minutes, so we have plenty of time for people to either make short comments or questions during the main part of the, uh, of the talk or um, even more time for more extended discussion afterwards. So uh, the talk is about um, erroneous statistical reasoning in the APS publication, Physical Review, Physics Education Research, uh, and also about related issues uh, with the APS on, on similar research. The type of statistical reasoning I'm going to focus on is causal inference, but there will be some discussion of other types of statistical errors. Uh, so what is causal inference? Physics ed education research, like many other social sciences, is aimed at helping you decide what to do to get outcomes that you want. That's how you make it some sort of rational policy decision. And by definition, causality means if you do X, how will that change uh, some expected outcome Y that you care about? Uh, often, well, it, of course, it's well known that you can't just look at the correlation between the variable X and the variable Y and infer that the causal effect of changing X corresponds to the correlation between them. Uh, correlation is not causation, as the saying goes. Uh, instead, one can often represent a causal pattern by a direct, a, directed acyclic graph called the DAG, uh, and an example would look like this. X is the thing you might be able to change. Uh, y is the thing whose uh, outcome, that's the outcome you'd like to change. And there may be some direct causal effect of X on Y represented by this little arrow here, where if you change X, Y will change. Um, some of that causation may flow through another variable called the mediator. It'll still be a causal effect, but if you can somehow grab a hold of the mediator, you can interrupt um, that causal effect. Some correlations between X and Y may result from another variable, which is a, uh, serves as a cause of both of them, this confounder. Um, and uh, you would want to control for that confounder. And then there's various other things which we're showing here that uh, I'm not going to go into because this is not a tutorial about DAGs. So let's give an example of a type of causal claim that appears in PRPER. This is the title of a paper that appeared there. Uh, why female science, technology, engineering, and math majors do not identify with physics. They do not think others see them that way. That's a pretty clear causal claim. If you can change how a student thinks that others see them, that will cause some major effect on whether they then identify as, as physics type people. Um, and that, as I said, appeared in a PRPER. What sort of evidence was used to uh, support this? The basic uh, method used was to give some surveys on various attitudes, like uh, perceived recognition, whether people feel that they've been recognized uh, for what they're doing in physics, whether, they're, say, they're interested in physics, whether they feel like they're good at doing physics, and finally, whether they identify as a physics person. So you get some uh, survey responses between these, and then those really can be described by a simple correlation matrix. Uh, you hear these coefficients are representing normalized versions of each of these variables, where it's, each one is rescaled to have a mean of zero and um, variance of one. 
So there, there would just be a, a correlation coefficient matrix. That's what the data actually are. But instead of representing that as a correlation coefficient matrix, one could assume a causal pattern represented by one of those DAGs, a set of arrows here. Um, so for example, gender has an effect on interest, gender has an effect on perceived recognition, um, perceived recognition has an effect on interest and so on. And then one can re-express the correlation coefficient matrix in terms of these causal coefficients. Basically, uh, if you had an arrow connecting each pair of variables, you could represent any uh, correlation coefficient matrix. In this case, only one arrow is missing. There's nothing connecting gender directly to a uh, physics person, the identity variable, um, not the identity matrix. Um, and the reason that's left out is that when these were expressed in this way, it turned out that coefficient was so small that it wasn't statistically significant given the sample size. So um, they follow a rule of dropping uh, statistically insignificant uh, coefficients. And the uh, effect, which is described in their title and abstract, is the effect represented by this arrow, gender on perceived recognition. That somehow in the social context of teaching assistants, uh, family, friends, and so on, females are going to perceive less recognition than males. So the, the entire uh, point of the paper concerns this arrow. It doesn't go into depth about what accounts for this arrow, but it's entirely about the existence of this coefficient, which is moderately large. Here, gender would account for 0.27 squared, uh, about 7% of the variance in perceived recognition, which would be enough uh, to pay some attention to. Now, the impression is left, if you read papers of this sort, that the data give you uh, what sort of causal pattern you're going to use. And in fact, they did in one case. They, the data set dropped the direct arrow from gender to identity once you've chosen this type of DAG. However, it's important to realize that the data do not tell you what the underlying DAG is. For example, this DAG, which is identical in all respects, except the arrow from interest to recognition has been reversed, is Markov equivalent to the DAG that they use. What does Markov equivalent mean? It means it does exactly as good a job of fitting the data with exactly the same number of adjustable parameters. And it's not too hard to see why that would be true here. Um, we're only temporarily interested in the three variables, gender, recognition, and interest. We have three arrows between them. There are three uh, correlation coefficients and you can fit um, three variables, uh, three equations with three unknowns. Um, and we still have three equations and three unknowns, regardless of which way this, um, this arrow points. So what happens to the coefficient that we're interested in if we happen to choose this arrow from interest to recognition instead of from recognition to interest? By the way, I think it's perfectly reasonable, although all of these attempts to squeeze uh, relations developed over time between variables that develop over time into some little single time causal day, all of that's at best a cartoon. If you're going to make a cartoon, having interest affect recognition makes at least as much sense as having recognition affect interest. Usually you get interested in something, you do something and people recognize it rather than people start recognize you we're doing something before you're even interested in it. So this alternate DAG is at least as uh, plausible as the one that they used. 
And let's see what happens to the coefficient that we're interested in here when we use this alternate DAG. The alternate DAG allows another way for gender to flow to recognition. It can go through interest rather than just in their DAG directly to recognition. And if you do this uh, alternate DAG, this coefficient drops from 0.27 to 0.05 with standard two sigma error bars of about 0.10. So this is uh, not close to being statistically significant in addition to being you know, actually very small, even if you had a, a large sample with small error bars. So the data themselves here show no major effect of the type that uh, forms the title abstract, the point of the paper. In fact, it doesn't even show an effect that passes their own conventional significance test. I mean, there might be an effect there, but the data don't, don't tell you that because you can fit them just as well with something that doesn't have that uh, effect at all. So if you drop that insignificant coefficient in the revised DAG, you get a new equivalence class of DAGs where you can flip some other arrows as well in all of them all of the gender effect is 100% mediated by interest, not by any of the other uh, attitudinal variables. And this uh, other equivalence class, incidentally, also includes DAGs in which recognition has no causal effect on anything. So it, it would be doubly, it doubly zeroes out uh, the process that they were talking about. That is, there's no longer an arrow from gender to recognition other than the one mediated by interest. And there's no recognition, for, no arrow from recognition to anything else. So the data do not support the interpretation. They don't flatly contradict the interpretation. They just don't tell you anything about that topic. Everything is put in by choosing what DAG to use. And so now we have the question, how do they choose between this DAG and that DAG? This one and that one. There's gotta be some rule that they say. So you read the paper and in the entire paper, I forget a dozen pages or whatever, there's only one phrase that gives you a clue as to how that choice was made. We only use the suggestions that were theoretically plausible. That kind of begs the question, what's theoretical plausibility? Why is that one plausible, but that one not plausible? So as I say, it doesn't say in the paper, but I was able to find out what the criteria were later because just as an exercise, I made a comment, I submitted a comment to PRPER on a follow-on paper that had a lot in common with this, just to see if they would ever publish a comment, and got a reply, a formal reply from the authors to my comment. It was a long reply, but essentially repeated the phrase that I've got here below. We selected models based on our theoretical framework related to equity and inclusion, as well as instructional relevance and other supporting evidence, i.e. whether these instructional implications will have positive influence on the instructors and their pedagogical approaches in alignment with our theoretical framework. This is a key point, so let me just go over that again. What they're saying is they know what a good way for instructors to behave is. They know how instructors ought to behave. They express that in what they call a theoretical framework, they translate their theoretical framework into a DAG, and then they just slap their data on top of the DAG, which is derived from their prior assumption about what is a good way for instructors to behave. So all of those nominal conclusions are put in by hand at the beginning. They're not derived from data. Um, by the way, when I say maybe we could change the arrow from 
between interest and perceived recognition. Yeah, if you look at some of the later papers, sure enough, when they want to tell a different story, there's the arrow from interest to recognition goes the way that I suggested it could go in, in the alternative day. And this, well, enough said about that. Now, am I picking out just one paper and it's an anomaly and it's just pure neurosis instead of largely neurosis to worry about it? I don't think so. Because just from the same group looking in the last couple of years, 2021 and 2022, again, confining us, ourselves to PRPER, here's whatever, eight more papers, all making essentially the same error, taking some prior assumptions, translating them to a theoretical framework, expressing that as a DAG, and then using the data just to decorate the DAG with coefficients and acting as if the data had told them what the DAG was to use. Notice that four of these papers were either picked out by the editors as something particularly to suggest or chosen for our little physics.org uh, physics magazine um, to be featured. So these are not uh, particularly obscure. In fact, they seem to be favorites of the editor. Now there's another um, paper, you know, it's not just one group. There's another paper by an entirely separate group on whether out of class science activities affect various attitudes. It has the same causal errors as this paper I talked about. It's much harder to talk about because it's filled with so much confusion that you can hardly get your hand on one particular error to focus on. And one of the authors of that paper is a board member, uh, the editorial board of PRPER. There's another paper on admissions procedures, what, what uh, causes students to get admitted as graduate students. Uh, that makes similar causal errors plus a bunch of other elementary stats errors. Uh, these ones that are in red here, by the way, are ones where I've written up formal critiques of them, not just notice the paper, but have something you can read, um, all published or allegedly in press. Um, another paper dealt with teaching methods and predicting grades. Uh, it actually had some perfectly reasonable causal reasoning in it, but then jumped over to causal conclusions about variables that didn't even appear in the analysis. That was another editor's suggestion, as was this paper. There's another paper uh, that tried to present how to uh, use causal methods on DAGs, and um, it has no special action content. It's just a methods paper, uh, but the methods weren't right. And I think that that's important to notice because it suggests that overall the field of physics education research has been isolated from the field of how you actually do causal reasoning. Uh, they need to get together and PR, PER needs to pick up the sort of standard modern methods. Uh, then finally, I want to talk about about a paper on whether GREs are predictive. It has some causal errors, but it also has a lot of different statistics errors, maybe the most error prone of all these papers. And it is both featured in physics and an editor's suggestion. Um, also, just to, again, to try and convince you that this is not some sort of isolated thing with one little corner of the field. Uh, the group that published these papers is being honored in March for broadening access to by APS for broadening access to physics through meaningful research based action. And this is the type of research on which it is based. So now what about that GRE paper? It has a, a clear conclusion that only undergraduate GPA is a significant predictor of overall GPA completion. In fact, it says at least a dozen times in the paper that neither the quantitative GRE nor the physics GRE 
are significant predictors of overall uh, PhD completion. If you start actually reading the paper, there's tons of errors, but I want to focus on two that should have been obvious to any reader, even if they were not statistically significant, uh, statistically sophisticated. One is that the way in which missing data was imputed was obviously biased in a way that would underestimate all predictive coefficients. That might take some uh, sophistication to notice, unless you read the supplement to the same paper, which says, oh, by the way, there's a better way of doing imputations. We wouldn't have known it, but research shows that there's a less biased way of making these imputations for missing data. And here we'll show it to you in the supplement. And when they do that, both of the coefficients, the predictive coefficients for the two GREs, flip over the little arbitrary boundary from insignificant to significant. So even if you didn't understand the math behind it, you'd say, wait a moment, you made a big point of saying these two predictive coefficients are insignificant. And now if I read your own supplement, you say, if you do the math a little bit better, they're significant. Every reader should have noticed that, but it appears in PRPER, it's chosen as an editor's choice. It's chosen to be featured in physics. Then as I say, there's a bunch of other errors. Uh, I can take the data from that paper and a preceding one. And although not all the things that should be given are available, for example, they don't give what's needed to fully fix the missing uh, data imputation uh, method. You can show that if you look in the cohort of students that were described, ones that applied back in the day when GREs were required, and you hold an undergraduate GPA constant, if you, as you go from toward the low end of the GRE scores toward the high end of the GRE scores, it makes a difference of about a factor of three in the odds of getting a, a completed PhD. So, you know, it's a pretty big effect. It's way easily statistically significant. And this isn't the place, and I don't have that strong opinions on how much you should pay attention to that, but one should not publish papers and make a big deal of them, which don't tell the truth about what the data actually say. As far as um, where these data, where this misinterpretation appears, if you look at the NSF site that describes the award that funded this research, it has a clear statement of the outcome. None of the GREs were a statistically significant predictor of PhD completion. It's a clear result. We see that the data flatly contradicted. Who would submit to NSF such a fallacious conclusion of their research? us. The grantee is listed as the American Physical Society. So this is something for which we are responsible and about which I think we ought to do something. So here's a question. Is the APS as a whole, and in particular, the journal PRPER, uh, going to reform? There's one sort of negative background fact, which is that PRPER has published zero comments and zero errata in the last six years. If you think it's because um, PRPER is so error-free compared to PRL and PRB, well, you're, you're free to think that. It's a free country, but I don't, I don't think that's a plausible interpretation. Rather, it's a different culture. After I actually did get published in PER, a critique of three of their papers, and they were nice, they, they were very polite about it, and they told me that members of their editorial board did not want to see my paper published, but they published it anyway. When I saw three more papers that were actually worse than those three originally criticized, and said, mm, I better submit another one, I got a very nice, actually a series of very nice notes from the PRP editors 
describing how they had a, a positive culture in uh, PER. They don't want to get a negative culture like the rest of physics. And so we do not want to set a precedent or encourage submission of articles that only critique the methods used by others. That's a really different culture than physics, the rest of physics, where traditionally, if something's wrong, you submit a comment or a counter article or whatever, and it gets published. Um, that's how we avoid just accumulating uh, a mass of wrong things that, that then people will say, studies show that. If the studies are wrong in physics, we ordinarily try to find that out, but apparently not in PER. Now on the optimistic side, PER, PR, PER has a new statistics review committee and it's uh, aiming to set some standards for papers that use statistics, particularly these sort of observational papers that um, draw causal conclusions or have causal hypotheses. And I'm pretty optimistic that this committee will come up with a good set of guidelines. That seems to be where they're heading. They actually have some abstracts uh, for the April meeting that indicate that that's, that is the way they're heading. Will that actually change the behavior of authors, reviewers, editors in PRPER and of, of the physics.org publication and other aspects of APS? I'm pessimistic about that because there's so much momentum, so many different people involved in the sort of pseudo research that it'll take some effort to convert what will presumably be good guidelines into actual change in our, uh, in our behavior. So that's uh, really all I have to say. So it leaves lots of time for discussion. I have a list here of various links to some of my publications on this. One of them, by the way, a bit of a miracle, they did, uh, PRPR did accept a comment on one of the papers, which I just submitted to sort of ping the system and see if they would ever accept the comment. That was accepted a few months ago. It hasn't appeared. I'm not sure why, but it seems to be because the editors want to get the original authors to change that confession of what methods they use because it's, it's a little bit too embarrassing. Um, there's some nice blogs from Andrew Gelman, the well-known statistician, political scientist, where he uh, discusses both the GRE issue and this whole issue of when things are wrong, does a journal publish uh, something that corrects that error. So that's really all I wanted to say in free run and hope that there are some questions, arguments, just or, or discussion because we have lots of time. Thanks. So anybody can, you can all unmute yourself and or put things in chat, whatever you'd like. Uh, uh, Take that off and uh, see if anybody wants to participate. Really? Um, if, if there's no chats or oral discussion, we can um, we could say goodbye. But uh, I do want to make sure that any comment anybody might want to make does appear here. Hey, Michael, can we uh, download this presentation? Um, they're all supposed to be posted by, uh, Sergey can, can uh, answer that. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know if we have anybody here from Virtual Science Forum, but all the talks in the Virtual Science Forum will be posted publicly on YouTube. And okay. this one should be up in a couple of days. Okay, so that, that answers that. And then there's a question from Sergey. Is there a tutorial on DAGs so that I could do the math myself? Um, there's a little one from Julia Rohrer that I mentioned in, I think, my most recent publication, 
there's a little a little book by Judea Pearl and a couple of collaborators on causal inference. Um, it's it's not a very big book. I think that if you want a you know a, a good start, that's that's a good start. And then if you really want to get deep into it, there's a big book by Jamie Robbins and uh, Miguel Hernan um, that's available online actually and but that may be deeper than you want to go. I would start with the little Julia Rohrer article, um, move on to the uh, Judea Pearl and um, Marilyn Glymore and I forget who the other author is, uh, their book, but uh, that would be a good start. Thanks, Mike. Any? Okay. Mike, uh, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, here, I'll uh, uncloak myself. Um, so, you know, this is this is going to maybe take you in a direction you don't necessarily want to go, but in the larger sense of things, you you say you you you're sort of like a, I'm shocked to find out that the scientists uh, uh, have theories. Uh, uh, cause them to, uh, uh, you know, to do a variety of things that you've been pointing out. And it seems to me that the, you know, that it's strange. I mean, you've got a, you know, particularly bad case here, but the history of physics is full <laughs> of um, people uh, using their theories to uh, 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 determine varieties of things about the data. And uh, so, uh, you know. That's, no, that's a great philosophical question. Um, yes, um, we do. The sort of theories that you don't bother to explicitly state and justify are things like conservation of momentum, conservation of energy, things that are really well grounded. So you don't, every time you publish a paper that uses conserve energy, say, I'm using a strong theoretical framework of conservation of energy. It's taken for granted. But if you are trying to say, I think the Hubbard model will be an adequate representation of the physics here, and I'm going to work within the context of the Hubbard model, you say it instead of just saying, I'm using the only theoretically plausible um, uh, model. And th that goes for many others. Or often you'll explicitly state I'm comparing uh, a nonlinearity due to dual heating with a nonlinearity um, due to direct hot electron effects or something like that. So that, and you say something about what type of evidence might help you decide between these frameworks. So my point isn't, gee, nobody should have a framework. It's just, if you're gonna assume a framework and it's less well established than conservation of energy, you ought to state what it is and give readers some hint at least as to what the alternatives are and what sort of things you might use to choose between that framework and others. Instead of just pretending like, yeah, this is the only way it could be done. And then in your next paper, you draw the arrows the opposite way. And then for that paper, you pretend like that's the only way it can be done without mentioning the relations. Um, if I understand, you know, from the grapevine, what sort of guidelines are being talked about, they're very much along the lines of what I just said, that if you're gonna put in a framework, say what it is and a bit about how it might be tested, um, that would be great progress if if that happened. Yeah, I mean, did that yeah, answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was a great question, Phil. Well, the uh, it, you know the fact that uh, people use uh, their beliefs and theories at every stage of the scientific uh, process. Uh, I have a big book chapter on <laughs> on this, uh, and and it turns out that it's just standard operating procedure in, in cross disciplines and uh, uh, and in the you know in physics one of the most rigorous of disciplines 
So uh, you can see it, uh, you know, in, well, you're, you're being hit a little bit by one place that happens, which is that when you uh, begin to review the literature in the beginning of your paper, right? Well, it turns out if you've got a group of people who in theory A and a group of, in theory B, uh, that um, the theory A people tend to find methodological problems with theory B papers, so they don't bother to put them in the review, they claim, right? And vice versa. And so you know, I mean, this. You know, I, actually, I, 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 my, my feeling of the cultural physics that I've been part of is no, you jump on theory B. Yes, we'll show we'll show that, that it's wrong, and you'll say why that rather than just pretend it doesn't exist, unless it's unless it's a completely crazy theory. Um, so it is it is a culture which has been very, in physics, very active in interacting between different viewpoints and, and to try and sort things out. And then occasionally people will figure out, no, wait a moment, you know, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, really those are different mathematical representations of under, what's the same underlying theory. So all these discussions, which things are in conflict, which things are different semantic forms, which things are different approximations applicable in different regimes, those are all normal disputes in and they just don't seem to be appearing in this area when one picks a framework pretends that it's the only one and then goes on from there at least that's that's how it looks in many of these papers by the well, way on, on the philosophical question i'm not claiming that anything is theory true can be ever be truly theory free it's known that if somebody's eyes weren't connected up weren't working for the first seven years and then you connect it up the little firmware in your brain that actually makes images out of all the you know objects out of all these optical sensations isn't there and you won't actually see things so everything is theory laden at some level but well i, I think the physicists really in my mind have done a the uh, cern uh the accelerator and the way that things are done there is extraordinarily sensitive to the to the top-down uh, theory-based things. In fact, presumably the design of the thing with two sets of detectors that they're attempting to do it in physically different ways, do their measurements, and that uh, you know when they uh, they do uh, blind, uh, they they really make it hard for themselves often. Uh, by doing um, blind uh, analysis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, oh, anyway, I'd, I'd like to, uh, Alex, uh, would you like, um, you can unmute yourself, Alex. I, I was just going to comment that I think one of the problems here is how PER findings and discussion function for a lot of physicists. I'm I'm a guy who, you know, maybe, maybe my own demeanor sometimes hurts in this, you know, I'll critique a talk or a paper, and people will come back to me with, well, I think all they're saying is, you know, if I critique the methodology, I say, does that really find, does that really follow? There's so many counterexamples, or there's this problem in the methods. And they'll say, well, I think all they're really saying is that when you teach, you should keep this in mind. All they're really saying is that when you teach, you should be open to. And on some level, I think that's that's entirely true and that's entirely reasonable. And anyone who's spent more than five minutes teaching knows that you do have to you know, keep in mind a lot of perspectives and be open to a lot of things because you're dealing with lots of people and people are squishy and don't fit into neat boxes. But then you could ask, well, we don't need a scientific enterprise and, you know, armies of postdocs and uh, grad students and research grants to tell us, you know, you, you just got to keep things in mind when you're teaching. We already know that. We need a scientific enterprise to ask whether beyond this general sense, there's something that the data can tell us. And, but because it functions on two levels there, I'm kind of pessimistic about nice, well-meaning people in the physics community coming out too strongly against certain types of errors, because in the end, they can always fall back on, look, all that paper is really saying is, and so not so much a question, it's just an expression of pessimism here. Well, just along the lines you were saying, by the way, 
embarrassed. I have a broken tooth here, but anyway, uh, let's pretend that's not there. Um, uh, one of the papers, one where one of the authors was by a um, member of the editorial board was on the effect of out of class science activities on subsequent attitudes, um, things like science fair participation. And the methodology was completely messed up. Um, and they said that the goal was to figure out how big an effect those had on some outcome. I forget which the outcome was, which actually given the DAG they drew was just the unconditioned correlation coefficient, but they never said that's what it was. And in fact, they never gave it. They seem to have forgotten that that's what they said the purpose of their paper was. Um, and then the conclusion was that science fair type activities should be both fun and challenging. You know, I think this is along the lines of saying, I'm not gonna argue with that conclusion. Yes, yeah, science fair activities should be fun and challenging. Agreed, <laughs> but you don't need a half a million dollars and um, sort of a nonsense, you know, tag to show that. Uh, it's just to remind everybody, try and keep it fun and challenging. Uh, maybe I can ask a kind of straightforward question. So suppose I really was interested in the question of like whether recognition affects interest or something like that. Um, it seems to you that I can, I think what I understood you saying is that if I set up my directed graph in the right way, I can get the conclusion I want. So what's the most, what's the most honest way to try to address RCT, that? randomized control trial. Um, those are not always possible. Um, and they're, you know, they're not as cheap as just sorting through some surveys, but they actually tell you something. You know, the, the gold standard may be a little bit of an exaggeration because things done in real practice are typically different a little from how they're done in a randomized controlled trial, but randomized controlled trials can demonstrate causality. If you, so that's that's the answer. Uh, well, if I if if I don't have the ability to run a randomized control trial, can I it, do something like take survey data and then say, here's one version of the directed graph, and here's another version that you might find plausible, and here's a third version that you might find plausible, and under this scenario you get this, and this you get that. And then yes, you exactly. That. Does it, that strike it, you as sufficiently honest? Or uh, yes, it does strike me as sufficiently honest. And if I understand the rumors right. That is where the um, new guidelines committee is heading towards something very close to what you just said. Um, and again, th that's honest enough. We, we, we're not looking for perfection here. It's, it's impossible. But um, the question is, is whether that those guidelines will actually be followed. So um, changing. Uh, hi, um, that was a really nice talk, by the way. Yeah, th thanks for thanks for putting that together. I was curious. So you know, you're pointing out these these methodological flaws, and you know, you're you're getting resistance from um, the journal and so on. And I wonder if one way potentially around that. I mean, this is just this is not a well formed thought, so I'm just kind of thinking out loud. But as you correctly pointed out at the beginning, there are fields, at, or you know, especially particular people in particular fields like cognitive science and so on, that do causal inference well. And I wonder if kind of getting them on board to kind of co write uh, articles critiquing things and stuff like that might be a way to get more acknowledgement of this. Because at the moment, especially being kind of peripherally involved in physics education things, there is very, there is unfortunately a bit of a kind of us and them kind of mentality among people in that field that, you know, if you're, uh, yeah, anyway. And maybe a way kind of around that is to somehow, and don't ask me how, um, recruit in people who um, are kind of acknowledged throughout, you know, social science and so on as being good at causal inference. Yes. That might be a way to get people to pay more attention. Yes. Well, uh, you know, I've been able to cheat because the best person in that area is my best friend. Um, and so I know a bunch of the other people there. 
And I would love to get some of them involved, perhaps at least one on an editorial board of PRPR. It's a social science journal. It's not a physics journal. It's a social science journal, though it helps to have physicists so that they don't say how to teach something that goes you know, completely the wrong direction. Um, but we absolutely, absolutely should have a couple good causal inference people on there. Um, and uh, I, if, if there was any move from the journal to, uh, to uh, uh, do that, I could beg my friends to find a student or you know, somebody who, who would be willing to do that and you know, I'd be optimistic. I would make a huge difference because you know, I haven't even made it through Judea Pearl's little beginning textbook, complete amateur. Um, and there should be some pros actually involved in this. Uh, here's a question from Joel Fish. How many of these methodology problems could largely be resolved by requiring authors to clearly state their causal model, state if the model has been validated or if it is an assumption, address whether or not alternate models have been tested, and address the extent to which measurement error impacts effect sizes found. That goes, again, a very long way toward addressing everything. Um, I would add one other thing, which is uh, Miguel Hernan emphasizes in one of his papers, even if you can't do an RCT, describing a theoretical, uh, you know, what RCT in principle would answer the question, the causal question you're raising, does a huge amount to help clarify this. That if you can say, well, if we could do such and such in class, this causal picture would predict this outcome and this other causal prediction would uh, predict that outcome. You can you go a long way toward clarifying what intervention you're actually talking about, what outcomes you're actually talking about. So yeah, this agrees with what Joel says, but it adds a, a sort of a nice way of implementing it. Mike, um, thanks for the talk. Uh, every time I hear it, it it becomes more clear. So I cannot blame my expertise in physics education research or statistical analysis. Um, so I wanna make a couple of comments uh, that are more general. So I, I think uh, what you just discussed based on Joel's question is a very good point that uh, also in social sciences and psychology, I think um, they are much more advanced in terms of uh, sort of setting the the methods uh, straight and identifying uh, these kind of statistical issues. So I think we could just probably borrow some of the progress they've made in um, discovering the reproducibility crisis. Um, um, and then it just becomes a question of culture. And uh, to that, my second comment is, uh, I think a culture at physical review, uh, is not just limited to uh, physical review, physics education research. So it's a family of journals. And um, well, you said they have zero retractions in this one. It is also a fairly new journal. Um, it is true that other journals in this family do have retractions like physical review letters has some retractions. Uh, I did a little bit of research into that. And um, you know, over the entire history of physical review, I've figured there is something like 90 retractions or less over all the journals. But but there, it's not just retractions, Sergey. There's also comments. I mean, I've published four comments in yeah. PRO or PRB just myself, and there's tons of them. Uh, it's comments true. Comments and so on, yeah. Yeah, so yes, it's right. Uh, well, errata are mostly things like typos, but yes, yeah. there, are, there are comments, Yeah. Uh, which I did not include, but uh, it's just implausible that uh, for such a vast publisher, there is only a, a few tens of retractions over so many years. Um, and so it could be uh, in the spirit of discussing statistics, right? Over so many papers, um, it's essentially a zero. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there, I'm, I'm sure there should be more, though sometimes the retraction isn't really needed because Oh, for example, one of my comments 
on a PRL, the authors initially submitted a response and I made some comments on their response there. Are, are they sure they want to do this? And they said, no, okay, we're, we're out of here. So that's almost like a retraction, an unchallenged, you know, an unchallenged comment that says you got your exponent wrong by a factor of two, blah, blah, blah. You know, that amounts to a retraction, even though it doesn't appear in that form. So I'm not saying that there's been enough, but uh, it hasn't been zero. Well, I guess as a scientist, you can be vindicated in in this kind of situation. But the other comments you made about um, grant funding and uh, you know still having that PRL on your CV, etc. Right, right, uh, right. Sorry, if you don't mind, let me take this moment to just remind people that in principle, Michael's talk is part of a workshop that is happening on Thursday about the reproducibility crisis in Kinetics Matter Physics. For those of you who don't know, I'm just going to put the link in the chat and please join us if you're interested in this broader issue. Or narrower issue, Brian. We don't know if it's broad or narrower. Maybe this is <laughs> maybe a narrower. Issue. Yes. <laughs> so you know, there was a reproducibility crisis in condensed matter physics. Is there any field that doesn't have a reproducibility crisis? There? Well, the question. I mean, the, the the workshop is basically going to address the question of whether there is a crisis in condensed matter. To what extent it is a crisis, similar to the social sciences or whatever. That's what we're going to talk over. Well, thank you. Yeah. So our little field of physics was hit by uh well was hit we hit it with three retractions from nature and science in the last year or so uh and so uh, many people kind of woke up and said oh do we have a problem actually because before many people believed we don't in fact yes i, I just put in the um chat a link to my most recent paper which you can track down most of the earlier stuff from um, because PRPER had decided they were going to stay positive, this ended up in a econ journal where they enjoy publishing critiques of other people's work. But it, anyway, if anybody wants to track down those details. Sergi, uh, Brian, are we? Yes. Uh, sorry, I don't know if there's like a virtual science forum per person here who's moderating. Did anyone introduce you or anything like that, Michael? Or no, I think you're the really speaker okay. and moderator. I, I, been... uh, we can introduce Mike now. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I think this means you get to decide when this ends. <laughs> I think this is it because nobody else has anything to say. And thanks everybody for coming. And uh... okay. thank you. Very thank much. you, everyone. See you. Hope to see you a lot of you Thursday. Uh,